valuable and prolific species of Pacific salmon. It's called the sockeye, and it's red. From their birthplace in the Adams River among the Shuswap Hills in British Columbia, the sockeye of our story traveled to the far reaches of the Pacific Ocean and then returned to spawn and die in the same beautiful little river, a 6,000 mile journey of incessant danger. It all starts in October with an egg, one of 3,000 that were laid and buried by one of the female sockeyes in a spawning red or nest of gravel in the Adams River. As soon as eggs appear, predators move in. Magansas dive and dive again to clean up the overspill. And even the little dipper, which can dive and actually walk on the bottom, will work its way into the gravel nest to steal an egg. But most of the eggs stay securely hidden. And protected from sunlight in its gravel pocket, our egg begins to develop. Gradually, Signs of life appear as the tiny creature inside starts to form. After about a month come the first recognizable features, the black dots of two rudimentary eyes. The heart is now beating strongly pushing the blood cells to all parts of the body. A great blood vessel runs through the center of the yolk sac that contains the food on which the little salmon lives. And in February, an enzyme dissolves the encapsulating wall and releases the tiny creature, now called an alevin, from her circular prison. During May, Having absorbed her yolk sac, the alevin becomes a fry. Now she must leave the gravel and reach the food supply in the stream above. This chink of light is her first view of the outside world. Instinctively, she moves towards it. She pushes her way free and instantly is whisked off by the current to join the shoals of fry that have already hatched. But it's not long before she's on the move downstream. After hatching, young sockeye salmon, unlike other salmon species, head for a nearby lake. It is in still water, not the river, that most of them spend their first 12 months before going to sea. And so, as one of a great shoal of fry, our little fish finds her way into Shushwap Lake. The lake is a nursery of good feeding for the tiny salmon, but full of threat. Swimming on through a maze of weed stems, our little fish finds the battle for life or death as ruthless as in the fast-flowing river she has just left. Eat 
and be eaten. Already, belted kingfishers, magansas, golden eye, and bufflehead ducks have taken their toll of tiny sockeyes. Now, young coho salmon and trout chase and feed upon the massed shoals of fry. And in turn, the trout are hunted by hungry otters. In the natural world of predators and prey, there are no rules. Each creature lives or dies on the whim of chance. But if she manages to survive, it is here in Shushwap Lake that our little salmon lives for the first year of her life. So in the spring, a year later, when the ospreys start to repair their nest, the fish in the lake below are about to start on the next stage of their fantastic journey. With the breakup of the ice and a rise in water temperature, the surviving millions of young sockeye leave the lake as smolts and head downstream. For our little salmon, now about four inches in length, the Thompson River is a constantly changing scene. Through shallows and deeps and racing torrents of white water, she is swept ever seawards. These long stretches of foaming water are highly dangerous to the shoals of little fish. The broken surface clouds their vision and hides the presence of bankside predators. Further downstream, the smolts emerge from the turbulence of the upper reaches and come into smooth water, where they can adjust better to their surroundings, but only to face a fresh series of shocks. Already, some of them have been eaten by garter snakes. Others lose their way and get trapped in a backwater, leaping in vain among a family of Canada geese. Most of them press safely on, although safety for a little salmon is never long lasting. As they come into the river delta, the irregular shapes of huge log rafts loom overhead, blotting out the light. Logging is British Columbia's biggest industry, but there is a price to pay. Pollution, whether from the logging itself or from pulp mills or industry in general, is a poisonous barrier frequently faced by migrant fish. Those of the Fraser River are no exception. Here in the River Delta, pollution comes from many sources, but the effect on the salmon is the same. Pollution deprives the water of precious oxygen, making it difficult for fish to breathe or killing them outright. To survive, 
they must swim quickly to cleaner water where the river estuary becomes the sea. Now they are in the sea, the salmon adapt to changes in salinity by regulating the water and salt content of their blood excreting excess salt through special cells that are formed in their gills. In the weird underwater world of a kelp forest, strange and dangerous creatures, bizarre in shape and colour, lurk among the weed and rocks. little fish find sanctuary for a short time among the waving stems, but a falling tide drives them into deeper water past piers and jetties whose weedy piles harbour more enemies. Further out wait voracious fur seals, tigers of the sea. As the surviving sockeye smolts swim westwards, the bottom falls away beneath them into the submerged vastness of the Pacific Ocean. This huge new world of the salmon is over 70 million square miles in size, ranging from a few inches to seven miles in depth. Its islands still uncounted. Its population, including myriads of plankton, hordes of strange sea drifters from the primitive jellyfish to big jellyfish-eating sunfish, their numbers are beyond our reckoning. Now, the millions of young sockeye from the Adams River form a tiny part of that population. With each day as they swim through their seemingly endless world, the salmon becomes swifter and stronger. But the larger they grow, the more visible and attractive they become to larger predators, the sharks. After three years at sea, moved by an urge to mate, the wandering salmon start the long, long journey home. On their way, the sockeye join company with runs of Chinook, Coho, Pink and Chum Salmon. Among them all are the sockeyes destined for the Adams River. And who knows, perhaps even the very fish we watched hatching from an egg nearly four years earlier. As they near the coast, where the line of fresh water outflow from the rivers meets the sea, it is their sense of smell that guides the salmon to the rivers of their birth. And soon they come into direct conflict with their most dangerous of all enemies. Trolling with hook and line is a very old form of fishing, but it can be deadly. About two and a half thousand boats troll for salmon off the British Columbian coast. 
This fisherman has already caught his government allowed quota of sockeye salmon, so that this fish has to be released. Although whether it will survive seems doubtful. Our fish has avoided the trolling lures and swims on beneath a group of sea lions. But it's not long before she's confronted with the most efficient of all man-made fishing devices. For this female soccer in her coat of sea silver, death seems inevitable. Or is it? In fact, caught by the net of a fishery research vessel, she is simply part of a tagging program to gain more information about migration routes. Unharmed, she's released to swim away and rejoin the migrant shoals heading up the Vancouver Channel. It's unlikely that we shall ever meet her again, but we shall recognize her if we do. She was a lucky fish. For these salmon caught in a commercial net, there will be no escape. Salmon fishermen catch between 16 and 22 million fish each year, most of them in nets. Staggering in its market potential, the salmon is a self-perpetuating resource of enormous value that cost almost nothing to produce. So prolific were they years ago that the numbers of returning fish had seemed inexhaustible. At that time, although salmon fishing was a free-for-all, the boats and gear weren't effective enough to cause serious depletion of fish stocks. By contrast, modern salmon fleets are capable of catching entire runs of fish. Now, perhaps just in time, fishing limits for foreign fleets have been pushed back to 200 miles offshore, and a program started to try to restore salmon stocks to their former abundance. The plan is based on fishways to help returning salmon past dams and weirs, flow control systems, rearing facilities, and a ban on high seas netting. These boats are fishing the narrowing channel between Vancouver Island and the mainland. And keeping company with the fishing boats, as though knowing, like the fishermen, that acting as funnels the inshore channels concentrate the shoals of returning salmon, packs of killer whales are waiting. Of all giant marine mammals, killer whales are among the noisiest. They rise and fall, at times swimming upside down, simply mouthing the fish 
and seeming to play with them in sport as cat with mouse. And those salmon that survive the dreaded killer whales may yet have to run the gauntlet of hungry seals. Fleeing in terror, our tagged fish seeks shelter. Ironically, her place of shelter is the hull of a sunken fishing boat. And even here there is danger. The boat's net is still fishing. It's killed a seal. The millions of sockeye salmon returning to the Fraser River system spend several weeks waiting in the sea before starting to run upriver. And there we will leave them for a time and follow the fortunes of other salmon that have already started to enter some of the more northerly rivers. All along the jagged coastline from Oregon to Alaska, where over a thousand rivers meet the sea, groups of salmon are hurrying into fresh water towards the spawning grounds each group finding by smell the water of its parent river. The river the little salmon left when they set out to sea as smolts. After the turmoil of the open sea, the clear water of a beautiful river such as this, set amid uncut forest, seems to offer peace and tranquility. Roots of standing timber control the runoff of heavy rain, and tree roots protect the river banks. Fallen trunks make nursery pools for tiny fish. But no natural environment, however congenial, offers total security. Always in the wood pile, there is something lurking. It's interesting to watch the hunting behavior of this black bear. It seems to know exactly where to catch a fish. It doesn't hurry, just takes its time, and then quietly chooses the fish at once. That extraordinary skill must be the envy of any fisherman. All too commonly years ago, logging was a business of heedless devastation. And sometimes it still is. Hill slopes stripped of timber to a river's brink. Breeding stretches filled with trash. Logs dragged across spawning gravel, which often enough is dredged for road building. Every river is a potential salmon producer, but however clean the water, no stream is of much value if obstructed, or has a bottom so heavily silted that salmon eggs die for lack of oxygen, and food organisms cannot thrive. Of course, there's no shortage of natural danger. Even the beaver's dam of sticks can sometimes cause fatal problems if it's built in an awkward spot. In this instance, the dam has divided the channel so that some salmon have swung into a side stream running through a marsh. The situation seems harmless enough, but from it there is no escape. Only occasionally do bears use their paws for catching salmon. They usually bite them and carry them out in their jaws.
An astonishing change of coloration takes place soon after sockeye salmon leave the ocean. This fish still has its sea coating of silver, but with a touch of pink. But the fish this bear was chasing has turned red. All the sockeyes at spawning time will have similar scarlet coats with pale green heads. For the bears, the salmon in this backwater fell easy prey. But overall, such losses are minuscule. In the rivers of the North American continent, millions of Pacific salmon are hurrying upstream. They have swum the ocean for thousands of miles during an absence of several years. And to us, the timing and coordination of their return seems nothing short of miraculous. The key to the successful upstream migration of salmon is their ability to withstand fatigue. Inevitably, exhausted fish suffer many losses when faced with man-made dams and weirs. As always, man is the biggest killer of all, whether at work or play. Sport fishing on this Alaskan river is big business when the sockeye run is on. This strange looking device is another method of fishing, but no longer used for killing. It's an old Indian fishing wheel designed for scooping up salmon. It still scoops them up, but no longer for food. It's now used by fishery scientists for tagging fish. This is another man-made device and seemingly impassable since it stretches from bank to bank. In fact, it's used as a fish counter so that an accurate tally can be made of each year's spawning run. Here, the sockeye are queuing up to get through the counting gate 
that enables them to obey their urge to swim on upstream towards their spawning grounds. An urge shared by our own returning run of sockeye, which we rejoin as they fight their way through the fearsome rapids of Hell's Gate Canyon on the Fraser River. Now turned bright red, the fish are nearly on the home straight. But before they can reach the Thompson River, and from it the Adams River, which was their birthplace, they have one supremely difficult obstacle to overcome, the narrow, roaring torrent so aptly named Hell's Gate. Fishways have been built at Hell's Gate to enable the migrating salmon to avoid the rapids. But on this occasion, the river is so low that the fishways are dry and can't help the returning sockeye to get through the narrow gap. The fish have collected here in shoals, where they rest for a time behind a rocky outcrop. But sooner or later, through that rush of water, they have to get round those boulders. The current on the far side is tremendous. Fish are gasping, many of them dying in the struggle. Sockeye salmon are very strong swimmers, and fortunately, although the run is spread out, the fish finally get through in good shape. The sockeye continue upstream through the Fraser Canyon. A great thoroughfare, both for salmon and for man. A major highway runs through it, and two railways, one heading from Vancouver right across to eastern Canada. Twenty miles above Hell's Gate, our fish face the confluence of the Fraser and the Thompson Rivers. Some salmon move left and take the Fraser River. The others, our fish, take the right fork and head into the Thompson River. On they go upstream towards their spawning grounds, getting occasional glimpses of bankside anglers, bridges and the distorted shapes of swimming boys and dogs. Four years ago, the fish came down that rushing river as youngsters. Now they're returning as adults. And with them, excitingly, we can see a tagged fish that looks like a female. Here the river is still strong flowing, but the water is clean and sweet and the fish are nearly at their journey's end. Travelling about 18 to 20 miles a day, our fish swim on out of the fast flowing Thompson River into the still water of Shushwap Lake. A few fish are dying of exhaustion. But guided by their fantastic sense of smell, the others head on unerringly across the lake towards their destination. Soon the fish arrive in the delta of the Adams River. They've traveled thousands of miles to reach. Now along the wooded banks, the sockeye mass in huge shoals. 
Despite the arduous journey from the Fraser estuary, most of the fish are in surprisingly good condition. All of them are red now, the males with humped backs, big hooked jaws and huge teeth. Among the sockeyes are a few Chinook salmon, big fish now turned black. They usually spawn earlier and often their eggs are dug out by the nest building sockeyes owing to the pressure on spawning room. So that in this river system the run of Chinooks is very limited. There is a travelling line of sockeye stretching from the Adams River 300 miles back to the sea. And as more and more fish arrive, queues of people have started to gather. On each of its prolific four-year cycles, the Adams River run is a great public attraction. Over the next few weeks, up to a quarter of a million people will visit this spot. They call it the salute to the soccer, and it's brought about by sheer wonderment. There's no disturbance of the salmon, no fishing. Fascinated by the sockeye story, people just come to watch these legendary fish at the end of their epic journey. Now intent only on mating, the fish no longer take any notice of people. They just lie milling together in great shoals until the moment comes to pair up and disperse, and the females start to dig the nests in which they'll lay their eggs. Very soon, every part of the seven and a half mile Adams River has become occupied by pairs of fish. There's a lot of jealous fighting among the males. Their big teeth haven't been grown for feeding with. The fish stopped feeding long ago before they entered the river. The great jaws are just used for fighting and display. It seems extraordinary that after living off their own body fat during such a tremendous journey, they still have the energy to swim at such speed. But the urge to find a mate and fulfill their destiny is indomitable. When a pair of salmon get together, the nest in the gravel is dug with a sideways flapping action of the tail. In fact, a series of nests are dug and the female will lay in each of them until all her eggs are gone, each shedding of eggs being instantly fertilised by milk from the male fish. All Pacific salmon die after spawning. Of millions of fish, not one lives to spawn again. On average, death comes 10 days after spawning starts. Some fish have already spawned and drift away to die. Newcomers arrive among decaying carcasses strewn along the bottom. But this grotesque mask of death is no disaster. Nature wastes nothing. In time, nutrients from these dead bodies will wash downstream into the lake, where one day the young salmon will thrive on the remains of their own parents.
Already these little fish are feeding beside one of this year's decaying corpses. But here, a pleasant surprise. At least one of the salmon we saw tagged at sea has survived the journey home. Perhaps the very fish herself. Very soon, like all the others, she will stare sightless at the sky. But the task she returned to do is being done. Soon the fertilized eggs of future generations will lie buried in the gravel. Until rain brings the spate that will sweep them down to Shushwap Lake, two million corpses lie in heaps along the riverbed. We can only guess at the reasons for this fantastic cycle of life and death. But the sockeye's future, like that of other salmon, is entirely in our hands. If common sense is vanquished by commercial greed, then the end of this salmon run will surely come. But if overfishing, river blockage, disturbance and pollution can be resolved, then in each buried egg, new life will always tremble in the spring. And nature will just as surely continue to perform her miracle of the scarlet salmon. A splash of colour to Easter on BBC One as Desmond Morris takes a look at the wolf in your living room. Domestic dogs come in an extraordinary range of shape, colour and size. But they